Welcome to Online Off Script, where we discuss trending topics and all things new on the internet. I'm Sam Olmsted, Online Optimism's New Orleans Managing Director. And I'm Mira McNitt, the Social Media Director. This week, we're talking about all things video marketing. Our guest today is Devin Bellamy, Senior Marketing Manager and Partner GTM Enablement at HubSpot. Devin is also the founder of Black at Inbound, a community space at HubSpot's Inbound Conference that allows Black professionals to connect and support each other. In his current work and various positions, Devin has worked to develop comprehensive marketing solutions in multiple verticals and mediums. Thanks for joining us, Devin. How are you? I am doing pretty good. How about you? Oh, we're doing great. Um, all right, well, let's dive right into it. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your role at HubSpot, and the connection they have with video marketing? Sure. Uh, my name is Devin Bellamy. I uh, have been a HubSpotter for a little over a year now. I work in uh, partner enablement. My title is Senior Marketing Manager. Um, I have a history in broadcasting. So before uh, I went full time with marketing. I actually ran a radio station. Uh, I've had to do a lot of video production uh, in the past with a lot of my jobs, and it is kind of the cornerstone of what I'm doing here at HubSpot. Very cool. So, so what do you do? What's your what's your main day to day look like? Well, uh, my department, uh, my team's job is to help partners grow better. Um, and that's to help them uh, help customers grow better, uh, use HubSpot better, service sell HubSpot, uh, and grow their organizations. And so what I do is use video marketing not only as a promotional tool, but also as an educational tool. Right now, our big thing that we are launching in the partner program is accreditations. And so that is to help partners differentiate themselves and get endorsed by HubSpot to show that they are experts in their field. And one of the ways that we're generating excitement in the partner ecosystem is by uh, doing uh, some pretty cool videos. The videos that you're producing, are they being like professionally produced or are they kind of like DIY in-house? So I guess you could say both. Uh, I do them all, but I'm a professional. So yeah. <laughs> Makes um, sense. I, um, yeah, I, uh, like, uh, the, the, the users I'm assuming or the listeners can't see me right now, but I am on a, a, uh, uh, Canon M50 that, uh, has its own little, uh, setup that I'm, I'm running right now. And, um, I have a green screen in my office, I actually have a studio in my office and lights and we do all of our editing in premiere. Uh, and the motion graphics and after effects. And so um, it's pretty nifty stuff. It doesn't necessarily have to have that level of uh, technical capability behind it, but it, it helps uh, definitely uh, getting people uh, engaged. Yeah. When you are producing these videos, do you, like, are they only going out in a certain area or are you sending them out across like many different platforms? Uh, they are going on uh, a number of different platforms, depending on where we're trying to reach our partners. We have a few different communities that our partners exist within. And so we make sure that the videos that we're uh, putting out are the best for that platform. So we'll upload directly to LinkedIn. Um, we've used Wistia for our own uh, native platforms and also for Slack. Um, and I've uploaded videos directly to Facebook. Uh, the important thing is that we're getting everything up with captions uh, and clean thumbnails and making sure everything that we're putting up is accessible across all channels. Of course. Yeah, definitely. Captions make a difference. Not even just in, like you said, like the accessibility as well as the getting people to watch it aspect. Um, Absolutely. What I'm wondering is if you're putting out your content on multiple different platforms, are you recording, like, are you capturing it uniquely as to what that platform needs? Or are you just going to record like one set of content and then in post make it platform appropriate? That is an excellent question. And I do it in post. Um, what I'm doing is I shoot in 4k. And then what I can do is just punch in to me if I want to do like a vertical video for TikTok or something. Um, but right now, every platform that I've been uploading to is uh, 16 by nine. And so 
I'm not worried about other aspect ratios. I'm not doing, you know, one-to-one -one on Instagram, but I do have the capability and I keep that top of mind for what I am producing. Um, but a lot of the stuff that I've been putting out lately has a lot of uh, motion graphics into it. It's almost kind of like a sports center layout. And so the uh, 16 by nine uh, does work the best. Um, but uh, also when creating, just think about platforms and whatnot and where they're going to um, as far as um, the thumbnails are important. That's, that's one thing people don't think about is that you can get dinged on a thumbnail on Facebook by having too much text on it. And so just keeping those things top of mind. Is there anything yeah, that you absolutely. think really, sorry, Sam. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> Is there anything that you think really stands out or you found really successful in the thumbnail? Excitement. Um, always the more excitement, bright colors, something that's going to stop the scroll. Anything that you're creating, you want to stop the scroll and make it jump out and so like just lots of just excitement and enthusiasm and the oh i'm so happy about this thing i'm talking about you definitely want to stop and click on this video right um but yeah just just things that uh, are engaging and not just a still um mm -hmm. something that is usually like photoshopped and has something uh more uh to it yeah that makes a lot of sense it kind of goes into my next question. You said you worked doing a lot of educational content as well as video marketing to, to entice people to do an action. Um, are those processes different to create those types of videos? And um, could you just walk us through what those differences may be? Sure. So for educational content, we haven't released any of it yet. Um, but the educational content is pretty kind of an informal video and so it's just like you're just sitting and talking to the audience and having a conversation the um the marketing style videos are a lot more um i i i, I almost describe it as cartoonish and with the number of cuts and the uh, level of excitement and the movement in the video. Um, I have a habit of showing my videos to my children. And if it can keep them engaged, even though the subject manager has nothing to do with them, then I know I have a pretty good marketing piece uh, that will keep the average user engaged. Okay, cool. So when it comes to the rise and fall of trends in video, are there any that you think are just trends that people need to stop putting focus into versus things that people should actually try to put into their strategy? Um, the big trend right now in, and has been for like past at least year is people talking to themselves. Uh, that is starting to oversaturate. Uh, as people learn how to do jump cuts and having conversations with themselves, different characters. It's been around for a few years. Uh, Ryan George has gotten famous on it uh, by doing pitch meetings. And there are just a lot of people who uh, are, are doing the talking to themselves video. I think that's on the way out. Um, but as far as what people should be doing is uh, creative editing. And um, multi-camera uh, conversations and just basically back to basics when it comes to video creations, the simple things like not staying on a single shot for over seven seconds and just basically what movies and television have trained us to look for. Those are the kinds of things uh, that we should continue leaning into. And, and little things like frame rates depending on the content that you're doing. Um, that is, that's a big one too. People don't think about 24 plus th uh, versus 30 versus 60. And it's like, if you're not doing sports, I wouldn't be filming in 60. I would be shooting in 30. Preferably for me, I always shoot in 24p just because I, it just makes the brain think cinema and think higher production value. Um, but that's just my personal uh, thing is long as you're staying consistent uh, and, and lighting yourself decently, um, those are things just to think about it. On the note of lighting, do you have any tips or hacks for anyone who might be producing their video content on a lower budget? 
Oh, absolutely. Uh, stop by Home Depot. Um, what you want to do is you want to get one of those uh, clamp lights. And um, they're these like, they're metal clamp lights. You can use them as key lights. You can get a desk lamp, um, like the kind with the uh, articulating head that moves around, point that at you. You could use that. There are a lot of different uh, unique options on how to light yourself. It's not so much about the lights you're using, um, but about where you're putting the lights and the temperature of them. Yeah, I've got a, I got a desk lamp at home that flips up. And so I use that um, when I'm working from home. And it has different brightness and, um, and color. Color lights. temperature. So you can kind of yeah. change the temperature of it. You know, sometimes I'm feeling ice blue and sometimes I'm feeling warm. So um, you can switch it up pretty easily. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So you talked a little bit about this in terms of how companies can create video content that stands out from the competition. Um, but do you think that there are kind of uh, specific things that people can do, let's say, um, if they are in different industries that can really help them in terms of video marketing? So, for example, um, would you recommend different styles and different types of videos for someone who may be in the uh, software industry, um, which is kind of particularly difficult to, to show value in um, with a video um, versus, let's say, a product industry? Well, the things that you have to make, you have to keep in mind when creating any sort of content, uh, be it video, written, whatever, is that everything is sexy to somebody. And even if it is uh, content that you wouldn't traditionally think that you put out there and people are flocking to it, it's fine. It's not for everyone to flock to. It's for the people who are going to nerd out about that, that one little thing, and especially if you're speaking to their pain points and then making jokes that they get around that particular product that makes them feel like, oh yeah, we're part of this thing. We're in this thing together. You get it. Then that is um, how you create engaging content. Um, and then there's like little other things like, you know, be a performer. Don't just talk at the screen. Don't be a lecturer. Don't be a professor. Have fun. Um, it should be, you know, entertaining uh, as well as informative. I know some content is really, really dry. But even if you're delivering that content with energy and enthusiasm, it will bring life into the driest of subjects. I cannot tell you how often I come across people trying to create content and you can tell that they are – they're just reading a screen and they were forced to be here and this really wasn't what they wanted to do. How – maybe it's a day where you don't want to be recording content. How do you still bring that energy or like make up that energy so that you do have the attractive video? Uh, whatever gets you hyped up. If it's, you know, putting on music at a time, you know, jump around, jump a jacks, dance a little, whatever gets you excited and hype. The important thing is that you uh, enjoy what you're doing, you have fun with it. But the thing is, is that even though you might be the subject matter expert, you might not necessarily be the best person to make the video. There might be someone else who needs to be on camera who can just be the face of whatever message it is, message it is that you're trying to get across. Um, there are quite a few companies who create educational content where the person on screen is not a subject matter expert. At HubSpot, our uh, HubSpot professors are subject matter experts um, in what it is that they're speaking on, but they're also really good on camera. Um, some of these people are like, you can tell they were theater kids because they're just absolutely nailing it. And so find somebody who can have fun with it and it'll be an, ed an education opportunity for you both. I love that you brought up that you can tell they were a theater kid. Cause I was going to ask, did you have a performance background before you got into production? Oh, absolutely. Um, I started out. Um, it behind the scenes is a tech and I was, uh, I was the audio guy in high school. And then, um, uh, my junior and senior year, I ended up on stage and just fell in love with it. 
And so that is where I learned public speaking was on stage. And then um, taking that, you know, that high school musical theater energy and then eventually getting into radio and broadcasting, but still relying on the uh, the things that you learn in high school, like enunciation and speaking to the back of the room. And it's just all those things really help out when it comes to um, being in, on camera. And so if you're looking for someone else in your organization, ask, hey, were any of you guys in high school theater? And that can start a very interesting conversation. And you'd be surprised who comes off really well on camera. We've got a few, a few uh, high school musical theater folks at our company. Uh, I don't think Mira and I are either, or, or any of them. Are you, Mira? I was. I was okay. very much a theater kid. The only problem was that I couldn't dance. Uh, so I never got <laughs> cast well in the musicals, except my sophomore year, we did Footloose. Um, and I was cast as the character who is a bad dancer. Um, and the theater director was like, <laughs> this is your time to shine. <laughs> Great cast. That's about the best I ever did. Do you um, have a favorite musical? Oh my gosh. Um, I actually love Jersey Boys. Um, I saw it for the first time in Vegas and then I saw it on tour and I've seen the movie a million times. Um, and I think it's just because I love Frankie Valli. Uh, mm. And so I'm a jukebox musical kind of girl. <laughs> what about I'm you, all Jenny? about West Side Story. That West Side Story is an absolute classic. Um, it is like, to me, the... Uh, gold standard when it comes to musicals and just you know adaptations of Shakespeare and like I, I could talk about West Side Story all day the the polyrhythmic stuff that they do it's it's just an excellent excellent show. How did you feel about the new movie version of it? Um, that the people who did it were insanely talented, like like scary talented. I remember I was watching some when they were doing their uh, press junket and I saw the lady who played Maria um, just started singing on a talk show for, and, and it was like, whoa, you're like really, really talented. And I just, I, I, I was very impressed with it. I was a fan. Um, there were um, some, scenes that were in the original that they cut out of this new version, understandably. Um, but um, all in all, I, I enjoyed it. I was a sucker for the cinematography. It was, it was beautifully done. Yes. Um, yes. And I feel like we don't see that as often these days. Uh, it's just like the, the spectacular cinematography, especially in a musical. I feel like a lot of people kind of just like push it out there, rely on the music to get it going. Um, if and they cut it up and as... put it on TikTok, I'll watch it. Uh, I'll, it'll, it'll, take me a, <laughs> it, it'll take me a few weeks, but I'll get through it. <laughs> I think my attention spans about 60 seconds these days because of TikTok. I, you know what? That's actually a great point, Sam. Uh, how, Devin, how do you make sure that you're making videos that are short enough to hold someone's attention, but long enough to get the important information out? Well, that is uh, really ties into your question earlier about platforms. So depending on how I'm trying to uh, get the information out um, and whether or not I have a captive audience really dictates um, how I produce. So for instance, if this is for our partner ecosystem and I know our partners are going to watch it and I know it's something that they're going to be excited about, I can get a little bit um in more in depth and more nerdy and uh, about whatever it is that we're talking about. If it's just a straight marketing piece, then I might need to create the videos and think about my overall marketing strategy with these marketing pieces. Do I need to do a 15 second pre-roll or interstitial on YouTube and then create a 30 seconds that's retargeting the people who watch the full pre-roll and interstitial um, and uh, basically just gear the content or, or gear the content for uh, people, whether how, how on their level of engagement, I should say. 
Um, that's one thing to think about when it comes to length. Um, and next thing is like, how much do people care about it? How, how excited are people going to be about what it is that I'm saying? Um, and keeping in mind that the sweet spot on YouTube, uh, that YouTube loves that 10 to 13 minute video. And if you're going to produce something, uh, for a marketing standpoint, that's educational, that's the kind of length that the algorithm loves. And so how do you stay consistent and produce a narrative that makes the video that long that it'll keep people engaged? That was a great answer. I, I, I've got a question about TikTok. Um, I'm sure you, you know, you're producing a lot of videos that are phone first. Um, you know, we work with a lot of people. I do a lot of sales and, and new business development who are curious about TikTok but they may not have a budget to hire an agency to do it. Um, do you think it's, it's more important to be posting frequently from that specific company's account, something that's a little more authentic, but maybe um, just not really well done? Or do you think it would make more sense for them to have an outside partner who can come in and, uh, and work with them on, on helping set everything up? And that's a genuine you question. I'm not trying to ask about uh, no, getting no, no. us new business. I, I, I definitely get it uh, where you come from there. The, the, the thing is, is that you don't want to put out bad content. Um, you want to look like a million bucks. Uh, one of the biggest things uh, when I was coming up in sales was if you want to be a successful salesperson, you have to look like a successful salesperson. You have to look like a million bucks in everything you're doing. And so if you're putting out poorly produced content, they're going to think that you are a poor company who can't afford to do good stuff. And regardless of how good the content is, you're not going to want to watch that. I mean, how often do you watch B movies like authentically looking for, oh man, this movie's going to be good. No, you want something schlocky and hokey that you're going to laugh at. That's not what you want your company to be producing. You don't want to be producing B movie style things and like don't just don't it, you're better off not doing it um than putting out something bad if you're going to um if you see an opportunity for video production to uh be an impactful lead generator or demand generator you need to work with somebody who's good at it um don't try to kick out subpar content yourself um, because it's going to work against you. All right. So we have time for one more question and I want to make this a big hitter. If someone were to walk away from listening to this episode, remembering only one thing, I know we've talked a lot about a lot today. It could be one of the things we talked about might be something we haven't even touched on yet. What one thing do you want someone to remember from this? Um, something that I actually haven't said, your phone is way more powerful than you think. And it doesn't take much in the way of upgrades to turn your phone into a high value, uh, production, uh, piece. It, it's your phones, uh, especially if your phone has come out in the last two years, the, um, the codex on it, the lenses on it, the things that your phone is capable of producing, um, are amazing. The things that you can do with third party apps on your phone, uh, are amazing. And it's like, like my biggest, uh, video was shot on green screen with my phone because I didn't have my M50 with me. And so I just shot it with my phone and it looked crispy, gorgeous because I lit it correctly. It's like, don't shoot with a potato. You can, but don't think that you need to spend thousands of dollars on equipment and lights in order to get everything perfect. Literally years with Home Depot lights and using um, scrim that I got on eBay as a diffuser to uh, make the, uh, the make the shadows not be harsh. I mean, you can get the job done. It's just about putting your best foot forward and doing it. And don't be afraid to practice. Make content that will never see the light of day. If you are gung-ho on learning how to do this on your own, just do it and keep practicing and show it to your friends and family. And eventually you'll not suck. 100%. Yeah, the whole time you're talking about 
the frames per second that you're using or the definition that you're using. I'm like, yeah, my phone does all of that. Um, so anyone who's thinking like, I want to shoot in 4K, literally the like four most recent models of iPhone do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have um, a below average uh, uh, Android Galaxy. Like I'm, I'm two generations behind and it's not even the high end Galaxies and I shoot in 4K. And so, and I'm shooting in 4K, 24P. The thing is looking crispy, like full on cinematic videos of my kids running through pumpkin patches, looking like I'm just out of the next Kubrick film or something. It's, you can do so many things with the device in your pocket. The limit is your creativity, imagination, and how well you light the damn thing. Love it. All right, Devin, thank you so much. Before we wrap up, is there anywhere um, people can find you online? Is there anything you'd like to, to promote while you're here? Um, yeah, I am online, Devin Bellamy uh, on LinkedIn. I'm easy to find. Uh, you can Google me. I'm, you know, I, I've pretty much cornered my name. Uh, my son, Devin Jr., he's going to have a hard time growing up, uh, getting out of my shadow digitally. But uh, hopefully he accepts the challenge. And uh, if you're ever curious about HubSpot marketing in general, you can always tune in to a podcast that I'm host of, uh, The Hub Heroes. You can go to thehubheroes.com. It's me, George B. Thomas, and Max Cohen nerding out about the flywheel. Perfect. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast. And if there's anything you'd like to hear us discuss, reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And as always, stay optimistic. <laughs>